Last year, how many people were here last year? Do you remember the 50-50 raffle? All right, Representative Aaron Libby won that raffle. And then felt really guilty about winning. And I said, you don't feel guilty about winning a raffle. You took the chance, you won the money, and you took it, well actually, to be honest with you, I think your fiance took it to, for your wedding. So you shouldn't feel bad about that. So Aaron is actually a, a state representative over in Maine. And Aaron was elected in 2010, he just won re-election, but, and he's kind of like the citizen politician, he's, a, he's actually a farmer. And some of you, you know, a lot, of, a lot of us don't think a lot, sometimes politicians, we, you know, they're just, the, especially in New Hampshire, I mean, they're my freaking neighbor, they're not like something we put up on a pedestal necessarily. I mean, some of them hate us and want us to move out of the state, but we ain't. And, but Aaron is, 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 Maine is very similar to New Hampshire in that respect, where they're citizen politicians, so to speak. But Aaron has been coming to Porkfest for years. Aaron's been coming to Liberty Forum for years. And so I had a great chance to work with him at the Ron Paul campaign over in Maine and here in New Hampshire. So it's always great, I think, in the spirit of Arcadia. Yeah, finger vine. There's also a great talk on that tomorrow that in the spirit of Arcadia, we have to be friends with our Vermont neighbors and our maniac neighbors. So, because in the future, they're gonna be a country with us, right? So, please give a warm oak and a representative Aaron Libby. Thank you. He's a little bit shorter than he is. Now, first, I really do wanna thank Chris or should I say, soon to be Rand Paul's freaking giant? <laughs> yep. Some purist in the crowd, I guess. Anyway. Now, while I, was, while I was still in high school, I remember my father mentioning about a group of people that had planned to move to a particular state with the intent of injecting that state with a much needed shot of liberty. I remember in the evenings, always looking anxiously on the internet to see the any updates to see what state was chosen. Of course, in the early 2000s, the internet was not as mobile and accessible, so you had to go actually on the computer, not your phone. But when I heard uh, both the state of Maine and New Hampshire were chosen, I was very excited about this. Now, I, I gotta be honest, you know, I wish Maine was the actual chosen one, and we've got really good lobsters, so if any of you want to come move, you're more than welcome to. That doesn't help me. <laughs> Come on here. I know, just kidding. Just... Although it was not, we are very excited to be able to witness this wonderful experience that's happening in our neighboring state. I envisioned the many opportunities that the Free State Project would bring to the New England area. And for this, I have not been disappointed. I've been able to experience great events with great people at the Liberty Forum and Pork Fest. I've had the opp opportunity to listen and meet great speakers like John Stossel, Andrew Napolitano, Peter Schiff, and of course, Ron Paul. I found it amusing when I heard a New Hampshire state representative call the Free Staters... I know. A threat. But not only a threat, the biggest threat to the state. Yeah! No. with an action call to make the environment unwelcoming by restricting their freedoms. This state representative actually wants to restrict freedoms. At least they usually take the oath and say they don't want to do that. But what, is, what has come to become of our country when a group with a mission statement of reductions in taxation and, regula and regulations reforms at all levels of government to expand individual rights and liberty is seen as a threat. It's certainly not a threat to the people, it's not a threat to the business owners, and it's definitely not a threat to the taxpayers. I've been called extreme with extreme positions by my opponents. No sir, freedom is not and never will be extreme. Control is extreme. Yeah. Desiring to control a person's life 
For whatever reason, that is extreme. What we have today are extreme policies that are designed to be controlled by a central government. Controlling our money supply by printing fiat money, artificially setting interest rates, endless wars, runaway debt, the federal regulation of people and businesses, these are all extreme positions. I truly believe the tree of liberty grows strong in New England. It will continue to grow strong, providing that we provide it the proper nourishment. We will do this by continuing our fight for liberty and doing what is right. Historically, New England has been is where liberty was born, from historical streets and uh, in, in, in buildings in Boston, to the shot hurled around the world and the Green Mountain Boys. New England means freedom and liberty from the past to the present. The next speaker probably needs no introductions within these halls of liberty. However, I would like to take a moment to personally thank Tom Woods for the information and knowledge he has shared with us. With Tom Woods, it's not about generally the information that he shares with us, but more importantly, it's how he shares it. His ability to make information easy to understand, as well as easy to remember, is remarkable. Of the 11 books that Tom Woods has authored, the last three in particular, Meltdown, Nullification, and Rollback, a great historical guides to where we came from, why we're there, and shows us how to get out of that kind of a mess. I'd also want to thank Tom Woods for his many con constitutional liberty classroom lectures. One topic Tom Woods often speaks about is the remnant in our task. I find the remnant discussion very motivating and surely shows the correct direction that we need to head in. And of course, who could forget the interview with the zombie. An American historian, an Austrian economist, and the New York Times best-selling author, please welcome Tom Woods. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Representative. Thanks to, uh, thanks to Chris Lawless, who has to be like one of the nicest guys I've ever met. And his last name is Lawless. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> thanks also to Carla and everybody who helped put this thing together. You guys have no idea what an undertaking it is to put on an event like this. However much effort you think it takes, multiply that by 10 and you're in the ballpark. So to see something that runs as efficiently as this with people who aren't nervous wrecks. I expected Chris Lawless to be a nervous wreck running around. He's perfectly calm and fine. I don't get that, but great. You guys are just the people we need in charge here. Well, although I've had a great time here in New Hampshire, I am heading back tomorrow if the weather will permit. Now when I, yeah, we'll see, we'll see, yeah, yeah. Just as I, I live in Topeka, Kansas, and, and just as I was leaving, about 12 hours later, a massive storm hit and my wife's all alone to shovel and, you know, all that stuff, do that without me. And so the last time we had snow, a couple weeks ago, we didn't know it was coming. And so the kids, we had all this snow, the kids wanted to go sledding. We had no sleds, we weren't prepared at all. I mean, we just moved from Alabama, like, we, we don't have sleds. So the kids, I'm not making this, the kids had to go sledding in laundry baskets. But this time we had plenty of notice, so we figured, you know, we, we don't probably want to be on the cover of White Trash Monthly, so we went out and bought them the sleds. My wife sent me pictures of them in the sleds. I thought, all right, now I can be proud. Okay, I don't have to hang my head in shame. My kid's in an actual sled. I do love you guys here in New Hampshire. I grew up in, in Massachusetts. I lived there for 21 years. And of course, we made all our big purchases right over the border. <laughs> I lived in North Andover. It's like you could practically jump there from here. So spent a lot of time in New Hampshire. 
it is funny. Now, this the gentleman who introduced me it was, uh, I think, uh, gentlemanly enough not to mention the name Cynthia Chase, but I'm not enough of a gentleman, so I'm going to mention her name. And, and I found it funny that, again, that she called you guys the, a, a big, terrible threat. And so I think I had, a, as one of my updates on my Facebook page, I think I said, yeah, they're, they're terribly, th they're threatening to come to New Hampshire and, and be nonviolent. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Hide from these people! So I am very glad to be here. And of course, well, given the momentum of what's going on in this room, what else can I do other than say, I'd like to join you as a patron and I'm gonna throw in a thousand dollars in my office. Now you see why politics can't work. Because, see how awesome that was when I told you I was gonna do that? If, but if I had access to like the money of everybody in the state, and I said, I'm gonna use a million dollars, everybody would be all excited, except in this room you'd be saying, Mike, who, who is this guy? <laughs> all right, so what I wanna do is uh, talk a little bit about a certain topic that I've kind of become associated with because I wrote a book on it. And that is this topic of, of, of nullification, state nullification of federal laws. I'm talking about this because the, the organizers asked me to talk about this, and so here I am doing it. And I did have a book some time ago, and it came out, and it looks like this. Now you'll notice that the way they've done it, it's very educational, the cover. Because even if you don't know what nullification is, the word is stamped over the heads of Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, and Barack Obama. So whatever the heck it is, I'm for it. Very, yes, absolutely, very educational. So what I want to do is two things here. Now, some of you have heard this whole shebang you know, before or watched YouTubes of mine. I, I wonder how, by the way, in the age of YouTube, how do stand-up comics even survive? Everybody's seen their act before they go on, and so you only have so many jokes. I only have so many ways to explain this, but I'm going to do it one more time. I'm going to take like a, like a little brief little overview of what this thing is and how it's defensible. But then I'm going to talk more about how it is a kind of an outreach device for us. How this is something that, yeah, of course we favor nullification. We want to nullify everything. So anybody who wants to nullify even one thing is at least our temporary friend. So this is a way we can make friends. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about how educational the process of nullification can be. But first I want to make the case, because to me the case for this is just so obvious. Now I can make a non-constitutional moral case for nullification, which is that these are raving sociopaths who are trying to take my property and my liberty, and I'm going to tell them not to do it. <laughs> but, you know, there are some people who feel like, yeah, oh, that's not really specific enough. You know, I need, I need more. So I often will make a constitutional argument. People say to me, well, I don't care whether the Constitution allows nullification or not. I still want to do it. You know, who cares about whether the Constitution authorizes it? Yeah, and I understand that. I, I'm sympathetic with that. But I feel like when I want to win an argument, I want to win it on every possible level there is. So I don't just want to win it on the moral level. If people are going to try to argue with me on the constitutional level, I'll meet them there too. And I'll beat them there too. That's what I want to do. That's what I'm going to do right here. So here's the basic gist of why it is perfectly constitutional for a state to say to the federal government, we are not going to allow the enforcement of an unconstitutional law in this state. Now, I don't have to make, I, I, and I won't make any logical arguments. Like, for example, I could say that if we don't have nullification, then if we give the federal government a monopoly on deciding what the Constitution means, guess what's going to happen? They're going to interpret the Constitution in their own favor, and they're going to keep discovering new powers for themselves. And well, in other words, the history that we've observed over the past 150 years will come to pass. That's exactly what will happen. I'm just going to focus strictly on the constitutional issue. And it's basically, basically is two, two arguments. The first argument is Madison and Jefferson said, if you want to understand what the Constitution means, you consult what its friends said about it. Who were its friends? the friends in the ratifying conventions, not the Philadelphia Convention. That was behind closed doors. 
in the ratifying conventions, popularly elected. So we, we want to know what were those people saying about the Constitution. And when you look at the ratifying convention in Virginia, you find some very interesting things. Now, Virginia is a very important state in 1788. Highly populous, a great many important American statesmen hail from Virginia. It's very important that Virginia join the Union from the point of view of people who supported the Constitution. And at that convention, Patrick Henry was saying, I don't trust this Constitution because it seems like there are loopholes that you could drive, you know, big vehicles through, and I, I just don't trust. Like, for example, the general welfare clause. I mean, come on. Any old dictator always claims that he's advocating things that benefit the general welfare. What, what, what kind of horrible, open-ended path to hideousness is that? And what he was told was as follows. Edmund Randolph, who would, was a governor of Virginia for a time and then became the first U.S. attorney general, uh, said to Patrick Henry, don't worry about it, because this federal government is going to have only the powers that are expressly delegated to it. Now, notice he used that word expressly. I so say, uh, we mean it. If it's not in there, then it can't do it. And then another guy who became the first attorney general of Kentucky, George Nicholas, said, if the federal government tries to exercise a power that goes beyond the ones that are listed in this document, and it's going to try to impose on us some additional condition, Virginia will be exonerated from it. And he used the word exonerated. Now, if that ain't nullification, I don't know what is. And there it is in the Virginia Ratifying Convention. Now, following up on, on Brett with his uh, school is not so pleasant uh, project, um, <laughs> how many traditional government schools are teaching this particular bit of US history? I think we can safely round it off to like zero. But to me, that seems pretty relevant. And, it becomes more relevant when we realize that Randolph and Nicholas were two people among the five-man commission given the task of drafting the document by which Virginia would ratify the Constitution. So in other words, they were the people who were going to write the document that would explain to the world how Virginia understood what it was doing when it entered the Union. And it understands it in this limited way, that we are only bound by these certain things. And anything else, we ain't doing it. There it is. I didn't make that up. There it is. The second argument runs like this. There are two theories of what the United States is. There is the nationalist theory, which is wrong, and there's the compact theory, which is correct. The nationalist theory basically holds that first we had the United States, which then created the states. Boo, right, right. Creating states is terrible. We want to abolish states, right? That, no, I, don't, I know, that's not what you're saying. But the compact theory says that, no, obviously, first you had the states, and then they got together and said, hey, let's create the United States. Like, the, the states came for, in the same way that the bride and groom come before the marriage. You don't first have a marriage, and then suddenly you have a bride and groom. So this is the, this is the difference. Now, the nationalist theory is the theory that basically you will see Alexander Hamilton implicitly adopting, John Marshall, uh, Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, and Abraham Lincoln. Now this theory was not given systematic exposition until, from what I can see, the 1830s. It was never systematically laid out till the 1830s. And it's implausible because what it's claiming is first we had this big blob called the United States and then the states are subordinate. They came second. But how could that be? And in fact, if you look, just glance at history, it's obvious this is a preposterous claim. The compact theory is obviously correct because first, the Declaration of Independence does not say that we, this giant blob, are declaring our independence. It, it, says, it says that these, that, that they are free and independent states. And now not states in the sense that we think of today. We think of states, we think New Hampshire, Massachusetts, whatever. When they said states, they meant like Spain and France. They meant countries. Free and independent states, which, which can do all the things that sovereign states are entitled to do. So there's that, number one, in the plural in the Declaration of Independence. And by the way, if you look at the Constitution, the United States is always referred to in the plural. Always, never in the singular. It's not a giant blob. It's a collection of societies. The Treaty of Paris ending the war for independence acknowledges the independence not of a giant blob, but of a list of states, and then they go ahead and list them. Then we, we notice even during the war, 
And even in some cases prior to independence, the states slash colonies are already exercising powers that are prerogatives of sovereignty. So Massachusetts and Connecticut and South Carolina outfitted ships to cruise against the British. It was the troops of Connecticut that took Ticonderoga. And the executive in New Hampshire was authorized to issue letters of mark and reprisal. When it came time to draft the law that would govern treason, it was decided that treason would be viewed as being committed not against a giant blob, but against the states individually. The Articles of Confederation said in Article 2 that the states retain their sovereignty, freedom, and independence. Now, how can they retain those things unless they already had them? When the Constitution was being ratified, did they ratify it by a vote of a single blob? They ratified it one state at a time because it's a collection of societies. And then finally you may say, okay, but then when they entered the Constitution, well, that's a Venus flytrap. Once you're in it, that's it. You've, you've given up your sovereignty. But that is not the case according to the international lawyers of the 18th century, uh, among the greatest of which was Emmerich de Vattel, who wrote The Law of Nations in 1758. And he said that when you have a group of republics and they join a confederation, they do not become one ounce less sovereign than they were before. They're exercising their sovereignty in choosing to confederate. And then if they choose to withdraw, they can choose that. They remain sovereign. The peoples of those states remain the sovereigns. So what does this all amount to? What this means is that therefore, the states, the peoples of those states are the original building blocks of the United States. And so they obviously have the right to stop their own creation, the federal government, from destroying them. It's just a logical result of the system. And James Madison pointed this out in his famous report of 1800. Madison said, in effect, that our system does not say that our presidents are fallible and our legislators are fallible, but our judges are divine. That is not what our system says. And Madison said that, yes, the courts have their role. He said, but there needs to be a last resort mechanism when all three branches of the federal government have betrayed us the parties to the Constitution, who do you think that is? The peoples of the states, must have some last resort defense mechanism. Now, if, for more detail, I mean, obviously there's a book on this, but I have a free resource on it. Because when you talk about this, you get the same, like, three or four objections thrown at you again and again. What's one journalist and another journalist and another? And I guess somehow they're not, brains, right, the interview with a zombie. If you haven't seen Interview with a Zombie, go to interviewwithazombie.com and you'll understand what everybody's doing here. But it seems like when I'm answering these journalists, they're not all, other journalists are not reading my replies because they're making the same claims again and again. So I finally thought, wait a minute. What do you do on the internet when people keep asking the same darn questions over and over? You do a frequently asked questions. Mr. Blockhead took me two and a half years to come up with this idea. So I purchased the domain name nullificationfaq.com. I know that sounds an awful lot like I'm saying nullification, but I'm not. <laughs> it is like we planned that. I got some ringers of my own here in the audience. All right. Now, having said that, I understand there are people in this room who feel like nullification. Now, you, you talk to the, the general, general uh, run of, of the political class or, or the law professors, heaven forbid, or the media, and they just, I mean, it's like, you're, it's like a crucifix in front of Dracula when you talk about nullification. Like, oh, my gosh, right? Oh, my gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm melting when you talk about it. But in a room like this, to the country, people say, no, no, the problem with nullification is it's too tame. I agree. That is the one criticism I will happily accept. It is too tame. It is the very least we can do, but we might as well at least do it. And, and here's why, because I, I want to explain the merits of it, like why it's actually a useful thing to try. Because as I'm sort of indicating in the title of the talk, I think it can be a kind of a gateway drug for people. Now, this is this phony baloney term they use to terrorize you into thinking that, you know, if your son smokes pot, before you know it, he's going to have a needle hanging out of his arm, he's going to be dead in an alley somewhere, you know, because it's a gateway drug to these harder things. But I do think nullification can be a gateway drug in a good sense to get people thinking more consistently and in a more philosophically pure way about, about freedom. Now, incidentally, may I just note, because I am going to be talking a little bit about uh, marijuana, 
you are looking at the squariest of the square. Okay, I mean like, you're looking at a guy, like I drive a minivan. I mean like you just list all the things, like I, I, that's me, okay? But I just sort of feel like in a free society, you know, I, get, I do my thing and you do your thing. You're not gonna lecture me about my thing. And you know, we might lecture each other, but you can lecture people, you can talk to people, whatever. But like beating you over the head with a club just doesn't seem like, you know, or prison rape doesn't seem like the best approach to this. That's my thinking. All right, so here's the first thing. Here's the first thing that if you, let's say, introduce this concept to the Tea Party, which I've helped to do. I've, I've done a big tour on nullification. We get all these Tea Party people come in and they don't know anything about it. And then at the end, they say, yes, we are so ready to go do this. This is awesome. What does it teach them? It teaches them useful things. It doesn't just teach them about the Constitution and nullification. It teaches them other things. It teaches them, first of all, the total corruption of the law schools is one thing you discover. Because when you start following nullification in the media, every inane com or I would say every third inane comment made about nullification is made by some law professor somewhere. Almost every single one of them by some law professor. And it's the same arguments over and over. Every law professor is gonna say, well, nullification is unconstitutional. Now, first of all, these are law professors who, if you gave them 100 years, they couldn't find anything unconstitutional. <laughs> but suddenly, nullification is unconstitutional. Resisting us is unconstitutional. We are your overlords. You are mere peons. We are king of the castle and you're nothing. That's a honeymooners reference for some of you, some of you uh, silvery hair folks like me. But they'll say, for example, the supremacy clause means you can't have nullification. And, and the law professor version of the supremacy clause is, this constitution, plus laws made in pursuance thereof, plus any old laws we feel like passing, shall be the supreme law of the land. Now, who in his right mind would have ratified a document that said that? Obviously, it does not say that. It says that if the law is constitutional, then it's the supreme law of the land. But that just begs the question. Because what if you're dealing with a law that's not constitutional? Therefore, it's not covered by the supremacy clause. So this is why anytime I'm up against a law professor, or whatever, if I find out it's a law professor, I, wish, I just breathe a sigh of relief because I know he's not gonna know anything. <laughs> what they teach you in law school, basically, is a whole bunch of cases they don't teach you U.S. history. They don't teach you the ratifying conventions. They teach you a whole bunch of cases, 90% of which were wrongly decided. And then they go out and they spin these crazy nonsensical statements. But I mean, like, look at even Alexander Hamilton. Boy, if I can get Alexander Hamilton with me, I mean, that's really, I mean, like, you know, he's, I don't want to make him roll in his grave. I hope he's having a peaceful afterlife and everything. But still, I mean, Alexander Hamilton was not on the right side of a lot of things. And yet even he said, at the New York State Ratifying Convention. He said, acts of the United States will be absolutely obligatory as to all the proper objects and powers of the general government. But the laws of Congress are restricted to a certain sphere, and when they depart from this sphere, they are no longer supreme. Oh, I wonder why these law professors don't mention that, uh, that little passage of relevance. Or in Federalist Number 33, he says that the Supremacy Clause, quote, expressly confines this supremacy to laws made pursuant to the Constitution. Well, that's pretty relevant. There it is in the Federalist Papers. And yet, not one law professor will. Now, if there's a, a decent law professor in the room, I accept you from this, okay, right? This is just the bad ones. Just the 99.9 .9 with a bar over it percent of them. Now, I could go on, there are other sources, and at nullification, FAQ, you can get more sources on that supremacy clause thing, but it's just a dumb argument. Like, clearly, that is not what the supremacy clause means. In the law schools, nobody has taught the compact theory of the union. Nobody studies the Jeffersonian roots of this. Nobody studies, nobody's ever heard of the people who were the theorists of the compact theory. You don't, you don't get any of that. You get John Marshall, and all, that, that's it. You don't get any of this stuff. And in fact, even the Tenth Amendment is too cheeky for the law schools. Like even the Tenth Amendment, they're suspicious of you. Why are you mentioning the Tenth Amendment in this room? In fact, I have a friend, some of you may know my friend Kevin Gutzman. He's a biographer of James Madison. And Kevin, who's a professor in Connecticut, he's, a, he's got a PhD in history and a law degree. So he knows both worlds. And he told me that when he was preparing for the bar exam, he was taking one of these crash courses and they give you exam tips one of the tips was, 
when you're involved in the multiple choice section of the test, any time the Tenth Amendment is listed as one of the possible answers, you can rule that out. It is never the right answer. It has never been the right answer on the bar exam, ever. The total corruption of the law schools. The Tenth Amendment went from being the cornerstone, according to Jefferson, to being so irrelevant that it's not ever right. The only purpose it serves is to be a wrong answer on the bar exam. You know, there's something wrong here. The second thing this will teach them is the complete cowardice of most so-called patriotic right-wing radio. And by that I mean the big blowhards, the, the big names, you know, the Sean Hannity's, the Mark Levin's, you know the names, right? I don't need to go through them all. Bill O'Reilly, eh. Uh, I got a good story about Bill O'Reilly, but I don't know if I should tell it. <laughs> now, I'm only telling this because I knew this as a secret. I kept this secret for years when the judge told it to me. But now he told it publicly. And I said, what? Hey, you told this story? He said, yeah, who cares? <laughs> so it goes this way. So there's some, I don't, it, it was, it, was, it, was, it might have been Yankees-Mets. It's a big, big baseball game, and Brian Kilmeade wants to go to the game. And so he's got an extra ticket, so he asked Bill O'Reilly, you want to you come with me to the game tonight? And O'Reilly says, yeah, all right. So they go to the game. And then O'Reilly gets kind of bored late in the game, and, and they leave. They leave early. And it turns out this game winds up having, there's a fantastic comeback by the team that was behind, like a miraculous, and they missed it because they left early because O'Reilly just wanted to go home. So people are asking Kilmeade the next day, so, I mean, it must have been really exciting being in that game. He said, well... You know, Bill wanted to leave early. Ah, oh, that's too bad. But, 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 sure, you know, but when you were driving home, you know, when you heard it on the radio, that must have been awesome. Well, we, we didn't have, that wasn't what we had on the radio. What, what did you have on the radio? The rerun of the O'Reilly Factor from that day. <laughs> but when you look at these people, not one of them will talk about nullification, right? None. Not a word. This is all going on even though none of the self-imposed leaders of the Tea Party or anything else have endorsed it. None of them have. And yet it's going on. It's miraculous. And these people won't even report on it. Now, Walter Williams will report on it when he fills in for Rush Limbaugh, because Walter Williams is fearless, and I respect that guy. But they will learn. They'll, they'll go back and they'll say, isn't that funny? The people I listen to every day won't touch this topic with a 10-foot pole. Huh. Third thing they'll learn is the narrow range of allowable opinion in the United States. Now, some of you know my sort of uh, shtick on this, which is that it's as if there's a three-by-five card issued to every American at birth listing all the opinions you are allowed to have. These opinions range all the way from Hillary Clinton to Mitt Romney. In that whole area, you can say whatever you want, think whatever you want, but if you stray from that card, we're not going to refute you, we being the New York Times and the media and the politicians. We're not going to bother refuting you. You don't deserve to be refuted. We're just going to point out, hey, extreme person here. He has an opinion that doesn't fall between Hillary Clinton and Bob Dole, so there must be something wrong with this person. And that's where, that's where nullification is. Nullification isn't anywhere near that three by five card. I mean, I don't know where you guys in this room are. I mean, like you know, some <laughs> other galaxy somewhere. But nullification is not on that card, so therefore, you can't even talk about it, even though it seems plausible, right? Isn't the premise of nullification at least plausible that the federal government could do things over and over and over that are unconstitutional because no one can really challenge it? Oh, the Supreme Court, which is part of the federal government, could challenge it. Yeah, how's that been going? Right? Year and year after year, they have combed the books and can't find anything unconstitutional except two totally irrelevant things, you know, something. And so now people realize, wait a minute, why are we, st why can't we debate, why can't we even talk about this without being smeared and connected? Like, it helps them to realize this ideological prison they're trying to confine us in. People need to see that. They get told things like, you can't hold this opinion because the Civil War settled this. Okay, the Civil War was not fought over nullification. And in fact, it's interesting to note that when South Carolina seceded from the Union in 1860, one of its complaints was that it was sick and tired of the North engaging in nullification. And then Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, in his farewell speech to the U.S. Senate, says he's sick of nullification by the North. So 
Okay, yeah, I guess nullification had something to do with the war, except it's the exact opposite of what the propagandists say about it. But when you say the Civil War settled this, I mean, what you're basically saying is, if you're having a philosophical dispute, violence will determine who's better, and who's right. And I, I wonder, my gosh, I would so hate to be the eight-year-old son of people who hold this view. You know, I get beaten up on the playground, I come home, I got a bloody nose and a black eye, and my parents would be saying, well, you must have been wrong. I mean, look, you got the crap kicked out of you. Obviously, it's all settled. But, no, but much better than this, much better is, is this reply from Bob Murphy, your friend. Bob Murphy, host of the Bob Murphy Variety Hour at Porkfest this year. Bob said, couldn't we just as easily say, if we want to be perverse, couldn't we, if they're going to say the Civil War settled this, couldn't we say, well, presidents who violently suppressed secession, I guess they were settled by John Wilkes Booth. <laughs> A fourth thing that people will learn when they get involved in this cause is that the, the so-called the official institutions of conservatism and libertarianism will not touch the idea of nullification with a 10-foot pole. Nope, 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 you peons, shut your mouths. We have our legal experts here who tell you you can't do that, so shut up, send us some money, and we'll write another policy report that gets thrown in the garbage can. That's what happens. I don't think I need to mention any names. I think we know which institutions I'm talking about. And by the way, no, no. But note to my ringers, don't say anything now. We'll, we'll let people think about this on their own. The fifth thing that people learn is that it, it reinforces the idea that you cannot take for granted that the conventional story of U.S. history is correct. Because the conventional story of U.S. history doesn't have any of this stuff. Doesn't, I mean, I have a whole chapter in the book talking about how these ideas of nullification were used by all different states and all different contexts, and they were used to fight against slavery, not for slavery, and all this Nobody gets that. What you get is decentralized political orders are stupid and backward and unprogressive. But it's progressive to have giant centralized states. That's just awesome. And all progress comes from that. Ignore the 20th century, but all progress comes from mighty centralized states. Well, I'm not so sure that that position deserves the moral benefit of the doubt or that it is just sort of taken for granted that 310 million people ought to be ruled by one city. Like, that's the only conceivable way for us to live? Really? Like, like that's so obvious to people that we're not even allowed to debate this? Like, when did this happen? I mean, this, this three by five card thing. Oh, good grief. And finally, it helps us to, you can reach both sides with nullification. It'll help people to, to reach across and get to know people that normally they would think of as their bitter enemies. Because nullification has an appeal across philosophies in certain areas because there are people who feel very strongly, for example, about the drug war or about drones or the TSA or the NDAA, things of this nature. Then you have other people who are very concerned about restrictions on gun ownership and on health care and all this stuff. But somebody, I mean, most people have got at least something they feel like would be better handled by them, by their local people, and that the federal government should just go take a hike. I mean, there's at least something that most people can agree on with that. And so there's been a lot of great cooperation that my friends at the Tenth Amendment Center have had with people more associated with the political left on some of these issues. And so it goes to show, you know, hey, you know, we, we, we don't have to look at everybody else in the world as being, you know, evil and they're just out to get us. It, this can help build bridges and common ground, and, and, and I happen to think that the more we get out and talk to people, the more, they're not going to convert us, I'll tell you that, right? <laughs> the converting is going to be all one way, and this is all to the good. This is all great, all wonderful. Like, we can all be happy with, with nullification. So it's an outreach device. That's, the, that's my, uh, my final part. So yeah, okay, a Tea Party guy or some of these people, you know, maybe they want to nullify like 40% of the stuff. All right, well, so they're right on 40%. I mean, I'll meet them that, I'll meet them 40% of the way, and then I'll try and bring them along on, on the rest. When we started this Nullify Now tour, I say we, I, I've been a speaker at it, but I'm not an organizer, but Tenth Amendment Center put on this tour, Nullify Now, it's called. We had one of these events here in New Hampshire, at Southern New Hampshire University. So we, we opened it up at, in Fort Worth, Texas, 2010. And it was not my usual demographic. I, I tend to get like the college age people. This was much older folks, like Tea Party folks, uh, 9, 12 people. 
and they didn't know anything about nullification. And I'm sitting there at my book table all day long, and you know, I'm not selling anything. Now, that's all right, you know, I'm talking to my friends. And then I gave them a talk for half an hour. And it's right up at, it's on my site, tomwoods.com, in the right-hand column, I have some sample videos. It's one of the videos there. I talked to them for half an hour. After that half an hour, it was like they were climbing over each other to get copies of the book. Like, I mean, so in other words, they, they didn't know they supported this until they heard it explained. And they said, yeah, wait, I kind of like this. Now, I have a million and one problems with the Tea Party. But anybody who's open-minded enough to stray from that three by five card, I at least respect to that degree. And I was glad to see that. Now here's another way that it's an outreach thing for us. Think back to the financial crisis. When the financial crisis hit, Ron Paul started getting a lot more television interviews because he seemed to be a U.S. congressman who had some kind of a clue about what in the world was going on. But also, that was right around the time that Peter Schiff started getting a lot more attention. A lot of our folks started getting a lot more attention. Now, why is that? Well, partly it's because Peter anticipated this and he predicted it and he has all these video clips to prove it and that was great. He was vindicated. But it's also because we were the only game in town. What do the neocons know about the Federal Reserve? Other than they support it, because if you don't support it, you're not on the three by five card. And of course, we're respectable neocons. We never stray from the three by five card. But I mean, who knew anything? I mean, what does the typical neocon know about business cycle theory? You know, like, no, not a lot. So it fell to us. So like, for example, so in early 2009, I had a book called Meltdown that came out with a foreword by Dr. Paul. And I got all this media for it. Because, like, I was the only guy they could talk to. They couldn't find anybody who was going to talk about this and not just give the old Fanny and Freddie, Fanny and Freddie song and dance over and over again. Yeah, that played a role, but the Federal Reserve is the, the kingmaker. Well, kingmaker sounds like a good thing, I guess, but no, no, no. I mean, the Fed, Fed was the, the key problem. No one would talk about it. But then our people start talking about it. They went to us because we had an explanation. Well, likewise, there's no neocon out there supporting nullification. So where are these Tea Party people going to? They're going to us. They're looking to us for leadership on this. Now, I hate the word leadership, because it always means like Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> I'm talking like voluntarily acknowledged leaders, right? Like people, like, like we all love Carla, for example, right? <laughs> so uh, let me just give one example. Because uh, as usual, the neocons are, are off siding with the left liberals, as they normally do on important issues. So they're, they're all anti-nullification. So, so they're going to us. And so, for example, in my town where I live, my city of Topeka, they had an event where so all these sort of patriot groups in town wanted to have us come talk about the 10th Amendment and nullification. So who are they going to have come do that? Well, I live in Topeka. So, like, that's, you know, they don't even have to reimburse my mileage. You know, I, I, you know, I just walk over there. So that was no problem. Although, by the way, I, I do charge a speaking fee. But in, in that case, I donated it. I said, you make the check out to my kid's school. Because my kid's school is a place where they read my books, and I feel like I'm in the twilight zone that to, to, to have such a school, so I want to support them. Because that school is, in fact, a pleasant place to be, as it turns out. But, so I was there, and also Michael Bolden. Not Bolton. <laughs> Michael Bolden of the Tenth Amendment Center. If you don't know the Tenth Amendment Center, if, if you're thinking, oh, Tenth Amendment, I am an anarchist, and I'm so past the Tenth Amendment. No, 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 no. Tenth Amendment Center is awesome. Check out 10thamendmentcenter.com. And it started off as one guy in his apartment. And now they've got state chapters everywhere. They're quoted in the New York Times. All these, they, they feel like they have to talk to the 10th Amendment Center. And, and Michael just works so hard that it seems like, because the, the 10th Amendment Center is on everything. They're on, the, they're on marijuana, they're on hemp, they're on NDAA, they're on, they're on health care, they're on all of it across the board. Decentralization, humane living, I mean, they're, they're with it across the board. But from the start, Michael was so hardworking, it seemed like he had a big staff. And so the, the New York Times would call and say, oh, we would like to speak to the head of the 10th Amendment Center, please. And of course, the 10th Amendment Center, they may as well say, because uh, they would quote, they'd say so-and-so from the 10th Amendment Center. Well, they, they could just as well have said so-and-so from Michael Bolden's apartment, because that's what it was. So Michael Bolden comes, and we have this event in Topeka together. And I always say to people, by the way, you know, next time you're in Topeka, I'll take you out for dinner, because I know that's never going to happen. So I did actually have to take him out for dinner, because incredibly, he came to Topeka. So at this event, Michael gets up, and they didn't record it. It seems to me if you're paying expenses for people to come give a speech, you record it. Film it. Why would you waste it, right? 
Is anybody recording this one right now? Okay. I don't want to insult anybody. All right. So, if there's no record of this. He was so masterful, and, and I'm not easy on public speakers, but he was masterful. He had them eating out of the palm of his hand. I mean, here's a guy who lives in California, you know, like go, walks everywhere in sandals, you know, I, and, and here he is with these, you know, suit and tie, uh, older folks, but they loved everything he said. But he wasn't just going to get up there and just throw out red meat at them, because what's the point of that? You've got to challenge people, right? So he started saying, let's imagine, because right at that time, the gun issue was really, really hot. This is about a month ago. So he said, now let's imagine a scenario where 14 states say to the federal government, we're not doing it. And we get legislators that stand up and say, we are going to resist. And we get a city where there are a thousand shops that continue to sell firearms in defiance of the regulations, and they just stick it to them. And with every line, they are cheering, and yeah, yeah, that would be awesome, yeah. And Michael says, well, actually, this has already happened. But it's not guns. It's weed. So the city with the thousand dispensaries, of course, is Los Angeles and, and so on. Now, at first, stunned silence. Like, what did this guy just lure us into? <laughs> but then they were okay with it. Because as I've often conveyed this point, it's interesting that in 2005, when that medical marijuana case went to the Supreme Court, it was three southern states that joined with the plaintiff there, or I guess the, uh, uh, the defendant in that case. And that was Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. And their view was, California's law, we don't like it at all, we don't want it in our states, but we are more threatened by a federal government that can tell California it can't do this than we are by California's law. And that's what a federal system is. You have your law, we have our law. So even these very, very conservative states said, that's what a federal system is. And there are more and more people of that persuasion who are willing to listen to that. And let me add, by the way, that then it came time for me to talk, and I thought, well, I'm not going to be upstaged by some guy from California in my own hometown here. Well, not hometown, for heaven's sake, no, but adopted town. So I thought, okay, I got to say something that's, that, that gets him thinking, right? I got to challenge these people myself. So at the very beginning of the evening, everybody got up and said the Pledge of Allegiance. And so I said to Michael, all right, you thought yours was good. I'm going to lecture them about the Pledge of Allegiance. He said, no, you are not. I refuse to believe that. There is no way that's going to happen. <laughs> you just watch, my friend. Of course, he can just hop on a plane and fly back to California. I see these people in this supermarket. But what I said to them was, I had just gone through this whole presentation, again, which they, you know, you build up capital with people and then you spend it. You know, even Stephen. And they loved my presentation. I was talking about how uncivilized these large centralized states are. And I said, now listen, we said the Pledge of Allegiance here tonight. And I said, and I have to at least urge you to think about this one and indivisible thing, this one nation indivisible that you're saying, because that is as un-American a sentiment as you can possibly imagine. That is a French revolutionary sentiment. And let me tell you, when you tell a Tea Party person that he's accidentally done something French. <laughs> that is a low blow. I said, no, that was the principle of the French Revolution, that, that France is not a collection of states. She is a single whole. And everything is lost as soon as we claim her to be a collection of states. But the United States is a collection of states. It's in the plural, or they are in the plural, all over the Constitution. And I went through all this, and I said that the development of Christendom occurred in a decentralized political environment. And that all the horrors of the modern period have come from centralized states with this notion of one and indivisible. And yet you're pledging allegiance to that principle. You, I, I insist you cannot do that anymore. And I got a standing ovation from those people. So people are, I mean, people are so disoriented right now because of everything going on, and, and their own leaders aren't leading them anywhere, no one's telling them about nullification or whatever, that they're actually willing to listen, I find, on a level that I couldn't have anticipated uh, even, even just briefly, uh, even just a few years ago. So finally, I'll, I'll just uh, I'll close with this. What, what, what ought we to do now? Well, one small thing we can do 
is uh, just to get people thinking a little bit along the correct lines is we ought to try to slip the word nullify into casual conversations. So for example, uh, yes, uh, I think I'd like to have a gin and tonic. Oh, uh, pardon me, bartender, no, 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 I'd like to nullify that order. I think I'll have a bourbon on the rocks. That's how we do it. All right, so, so the Freemasons have their little hand signals or whatever. We have our word. You know, it's like, we'll know, ah, okay, you're one of us. Nullify, eh? I catch your meaning. But another thing is, just to bear in mind, I mean, what you guys are doing the Free State Project is brilliant and original. It's not just sitting around saying, well, if we issue one more policy paper, that will probably make these people change their minds. You know, no, it's not that. It's, let's, instead of waiting, let's do. And let's do something that hasn't been tried before. I mean, that, that thrills me. And, I, and now, now I'm learning about this Bitcoin thing. I still don't totally get it. But like, if it is what people are telling me it is, like, well, that's really great too. And it's another thing that I couldn't have dreamed up, and yet people are out there doing it. This is great. Because if we do the same old things, we're gonna get the same old results. And sure, maybe nullification will fail, but I mean, it's not like there have been like a whole lot of victories over the years. In fact, that, that's what I, I always joke when, when, uh, when uh, an official conservative lectures me on, you know, how dare you recommend such an unrespectable approach as nullification. And I say, yeah, 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 that's right. I, should, I guess I should consult uh, one of the world's largest books, Great Conservative Victories, and have a look at the strategies you people have been following for a hundred years. But ultimately, what it boils down to is, with nullification as with everything else, we need to set a match to that three by five card of approved opinion. And the flame that burns it, reduces it to ash, will be the flame of American liberty, my friends. Thank you very much.